Hello there, welcome to Cool Talk. This is part two of World War II. In our last video, we examined how Mussolini and the fascists took over Italy and invaded North Africa, how Japan invaded China and Manchuria, and in Germany, Hitler and the Nazis took over, tore up the Treaty of Versailles, and decided to take back territory that Germany had lost, and later decided to enlarge the country even further. Look at Germany at the time. Well, Hitler decided to take back Austria. So he went along and invaded the south. Check. Then he went and took Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia. Check. Then he and the Soviets invaded Poland and split it among themselves. He enhanced the alliance that he had with the Soviet Union and Italy. Check, check, check. This land grab and his alliances with the Soviet Union and Italy and Japan made the rest of Europe very, very nervous. So, as the invasion of Poland took place, the Poles fought, fought back valiantly. However, they were no match for the Soviets and the Germans. So, Britain and France declared war on Germany. And then Hitler, in turn, invaded Norway and Denmark. So the British and the French lined up on the border behind these fortifications that they call the Maginot Line. And they were there for about seven months. They believed that a naval blockade would stop the Germans. Now if you look at the map, you'll notice that the Maginot Line, these fortifications, stopped close to the border of Belgium. So they concentrated their forces there. They believed that the Germans would attack through Belgium into France. And they were right, but the Germans had learned their lessons from World War I. The Germans did send troops over through Belgium. They also sent thousands and thousands of refugees, but this was merely a diversion. The Germans knew that between the Maginot Line and where the British and French troops were, there was a gap. The Ardennes forests, mountains and plains that the French and the Belgium thought was impenetrable, but they were wrong. The Germans sent their Nazi troops right through that impenetrable area. The impenetrable area was very penetrable. So the Germans went north through Belgium, but also south through that gap, and they encircled the British and the French troops. Over 300,000 British troops were trapped in Dunkirk, France. So while the British and French troops were trapped, over in Italy, Mussolini decided that he would declare war on Britain and France. He believed the war was not going to last very long, and when it was over, he would get something out of it. Now on this map, look how close Dunkirk is from London. Winston Churchill, the new prime minister, called out for help. He asked for anybody who had a sea vessel to assist in bringing those troops home. So every ocean-ready vessel available for help was sent out. 600 civilian yachts, tugboats, barges, motorboats, along with help from the Royal Air Force, snuck out over 350,000 British soldiers. A miracle. They crossed the channel on June 4th. Now, before these events took place, Stalin from the Soviet Union uh, took advantage of the distraction and forced Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia to sign treaties allowing them to use their land for naval and air bases. Later, he would annex these countries. But when Stalin attacked Finland for the same purposes, it wasn't so easy. The Finns fought fiercely, and it would take over a year to subdue them. But back in France, uh, things were not so good. France collapsed in about less than a month. And Marshal Henri Pétain signed the armistice in a railroad car. The same railroad car that was used when Germany signed an armistice to surrender back in World War I. Now, Germany occupied North France and allowed the South to remain, quote, unoccupied. They call it Vichy France, which wasn't really true. South France was still under the German control. Now, there were many French patriots, resistors, and they were led by an exile named Charles de Gaulle, who sponsored the exiles in an underground group to use in fighting against the Nazis. This would last for the duration of the war. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill declared, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields, we shall fight in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Now England prepared itself for an invasion by sea, but it never happened. 
Why? Well, German commander Hermann Göring had convinced Hitler that a battle against Britain could be won by aerial warfare, so the bombings began. Thousands of English died in the attacks, but their morale was not broken. Many of the children were evacuated out of England, and when bombings began, they would go underground and wait it out. Then, with the help of a new device called the radar and a new fighter plane called the Spitfire, the British struck back, bombing Germany and destroying German planes. In October 1940, Mussolini sent Italian troops into Greece, but the Greeks pushed the Italians into Albania. So Germany had to help the Italians out. Hitler sent his tanks into Yugoslavia, and very soon, Greece and Yugoslavia both surrendered. So then Mussolini decided to attack British territory in Somaliland, in Africa, and he took it. But the British struck back, and five months later, Italy surrendered almost all its territories in East Africa. And speaking of Africa, Hitler's Field Marshal Erwin Rommel entered Libya and pushed the British out into the Egyptian frontier. But then Hitler shocked his generals. He would take troops away from the West and send them to the East Front, and he decided to attack the Soviet Union. Everyone told him what happened to Napoleon over a century earlier. But the Soviet Union was always in Hitler's plans. He viewed the Soviets as subhuman and even contemplated conquering Europe and using the millions of Soviets as slaves. Sounds crazy, right? Having millions of Soviet slaves? Well, this, along with Hitler's dreams of a Jew-free Europe, and it's evident that Hitler was thinking big. Evil, immoral, yes, but big. In reference to the Jews, the Nazis had set up to exterminate the 10 million Jews in Europe. And in the end, they did do away with 6 million of them. Now, this is not just anti-Semitism. Think of the logistics and the planning, the infrastructure, building labor camps, railroads, resources necessary to put this into play. Now, besides the Jews, 4 million others would die in the camps. Gypsies, Jehovah Witnesses, homosexuals, undesirables. A true horror story. But back to Hitler and the Soviets. Hitler said goodbye to the troops on June 22, 1941, and the Nazis swept through the buffer zone and pushed into the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviets retreated, but they practiced scorched earth policy, burning everything in their path along the way so the Germans couldn't use them. Yet the Nazis advanced steadily, and by October, they had reached Moscow. Yet the Soviets followed the same strategy they used against Napoleon. It was simple. Don't surrender. Now this young boy here, see how terrified he looks. These are Soviet prisoners of war. The Soviets were using whatever they had, young boys and old men, but they were not budging. The Soviets would not give in no matter what, and then came the winter. Many told Hitler that the Germans could hunker down and rest and wait out the winter, but Hitler said no, they must push on. So the fuel froze within the German vehicles. Horses would die frozen by the side of the road. Yet, they pushed on. Now, as I mentioned in my previous videos, possibly 27 million Soviets would die in World War II. Now, the United States had stayed out of the war. However, its blockade and embargo on Japan was hurting them. So the Japanese decided to attack Pearl Harbor, a military base on Oahu in Hawaii. This happened on July 24, 1941. The Japanese attacked the American naval base. Five American battleships were sunk. Three more were severely damaged. 2,500 soldiers and sailors and civilians were killed. In one blow, the United States were struck out of the Pacific. Oh, so the Japanese thought, 
U.S. President Franklin E. Roosevelt was quick to declare war on Japan, build up productivity, and soon they were at war with Germany and Italy as well. The U.S. struck back at Tokyo with the Doolittle Raids. Later on in the Battle of Coral Sea, the U.S. did further damage, but it was really a decisive victory that the United States carried out over the Midway Islands that kept their lines open to Australia, keeping the United States in the war and badly crippling the naval resources that the Japanese had. And while men went to war, American women turned out the most gigantic production effort in history. Factories of consumer goods were turned into war plants. In just a few years, uh, the Americans built 300,000 aircraft. 193,000 artillery pieces, 86,000 tanks, and 2 million army trucks. Now, the Allies had captured uh, what they call the Enigma. This is a uh, decoder, um, an encryption device that the Germans were using, but nobody was able to crack the code. That was until Alan Turing built what amounts to the first computer that was able to break the code. From that point on, the Allies were able to listen in on the Germans over the radio and find out what they planned to do. Nobody knows how big an effect this had on the war, but some say that it saved over 14 million lives and possibly shortened the war in Europe by two years. Now, Hitler ordered his German troops in the Soviet Union to divide. He wanted some of them to go further south to Stalingrad. And there, there was a stalemate where the Soviets bravely held the city. Now, thousands upon thousands would die. And finally, the Germans had no choice but to retreat. In North Africa, British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery and United States American General George Patton would lead tank attacks against the Germans. Now, Montgomery attacked Rommel's forces, and Dwight D. Eisenhower, American General Commanding Officer of the entire American troops, commanded an Anglo-American invasion of North Africa capturing Casablanca, Oran, and Algiers. In, uh, between January and May of 1943, Eisenhower's forces came from the west toward Tunis, and Montgomery's forces came from the east, and Rommel's forces retreated into the coast of Tunisia and collapsed. Now, the Allies invaded Sicily, and in Italy, the Italian people and the Italian king were sick of Mussolini. They had had enough of him. They took him out of office and imprisoned him, and signed a surrender with the Allied forces. But Hitler sent his troops in and they helped Mussolini escape. They put him in North Italy and set up a little makeshift government. However, this did not last long as the Italian forces came and took Mussolini out. They grabbed him and his mistress and had them executed. A crowd of people came along to kick and strike at them. So they were hung up by their heels for all to see. Things were going well for the Allies. They began to plan what to do after the war. And in the United States, the Manhattan Project was taking place to build the first atomic bomb. This was done in virtual secrecy. 1944, Operation Overload. A million and a half Allies gathered in Great Britain with ships and landing crafts. They did it in secrecy sending out a couple of raids along the coast to keep the Germans off guard. But on June 6, they sent out across the canal and 600 ships battled the Germans on the beaches. Planes bombed the coast. Troops disembarked. And in one week, the Allies took the beach. They pushed inland. And by August, they had liberated Paris. It felt like the beginning of the end. Parades were held. De Gaulle came along. And the French were, understandably, ecstatic with happiness. But the war hadn't ended. The Allies pushed on. The Soviets, for their part, had entered Poland and discovered many of the concentration camps and the unimaginable horror that had taken place there. Germany, which had taken over most of Europe, had now dwindled in size. Hitler and his new bride, Eva Braun, hid in an underground bunker in Berlin. 
Now, the SS was still fighting in Berlin, but it was hopeless. I mean, even the Hitler youth had joined in. Boys and girls as young as 12 were fighting in the streets and getting killed. Hitler and his wife eventually just committed suicide. And a few days after that, Germany surrendered. So the war in Europe had come to an end. Parades took place all across several continents, and now the Allies could concentrate their efforts to defeating the Japanese in the Pacific. And so the Allied forces attacked the islands across the Pacific, trying to kick out the Japanese, and they did several bombing raids. They bombed and bombed and bombed. Along with that came what they called island hopping, little island by little island, knocking out the Japanese over in Okinawa, Guadalcanal, and of course, Iwo Jima. General MacArthur returned to a newly liberated Philippines, but then came a shocker to the United States. Their president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, had died, and Vice President Harry S. Truman had taken his place. Soon afterwards, however, Truman approved the use of the atomic bomb, dropping two of them on Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yet, despite these two atomic bombs, and despite the hundreds of thousands that died in the previous bombing raids, and despite Truman threatening to use even more atomic bombs, the Japanese were willing to continue to fight, except for the words of Emperor Hirohito, who commanded that the Japanese surrender. The war was over. And the world celebrated. The troops would be coming home. Between 75 to 80 million people had died. Most of the countries across the world had participated, but now it was over. It was aboard the USS Missouri that General MacArthur received the Japanese delegation that would sign the terms of surrender. And I'm going to end this video by paraphrasing some of General MacArthur's words in his radio broadcast. He said, It is my earnest hope that from this solemn occasion a better world shall emerge. Men seek peace, balances of power. The problem basically is theological and involves a spiritual recrudescence and improvement of human character. It must be of the spirit if we are to save the flesh. We have had our last chance. If we do not, do not devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our door. This is Cool Talk.